Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to continue our MCAT Organic Chemistry playlist. This is Chapter 7, Aldehydes and Ketones, Part 2. I want to first and foremost apologize for not uploading as much content in the past two weeks. Grad school has frankly been kicking my ass. I am wrapping up a couple of projects and in the write-up phase and at the same time working on brand new projects and trying to work out the details of those experiments and that data analysis. So it has been super hectic. I plan in the next few weeks, especially during Thanksgiving break, to hopefully get very near, if not finish, the MCAT Organic Chemistry playlist. I also intend on completing the last two chapters for MCAT Physics and also refilming two videos for MCAT General Chemistry because the audio quality was really poor. And so I hope on making a lot of MCAT content in the next few weeks. Please, please just be patient with me. I, I am a one-woman show here and I am trying my very best and I do not want to disappoint any of y'all. So hopefully expect a lot more content from me starting now. So let's go ahead and get started. In the previous chapter, so aldehydes and ketones part one, we took a look at a couple of few properties and reactions of aldehydes and ketones. And we saw that these molecules, they have highly predictable chemistry centered on their electrophilic, positively charged carbonyl carbon. All right. In this chapter, we're going to take a look at several more properties of aldehydes and ketones. And we're really going to focus here on this chapter on the reactivity of the alpha hydrogen of these carbonyl containing compounds. And so the main objectives of this chapter are going to be first, we're going to talk about some general principles. We're going to talk about the acidity of alpha hydrogens. We're going to talk about steric hindrance. Then we're going to move into the second objective, which is enolate chemistry. Here we're going to talk about keto enol tautomerization. We're going to talk about kinetic versus thermodynamic enolates. We're even going to briefly mention enamines. And then in our third objective, and forgive me if I mispronounce enamines and imines, I always have trouble with that. And English is not my first language, so do forgive. The third objective will be aldol condensation. All right, so those are our three big objectives for this chapter. Let's go ahead and get started. Again, in the previous chapter, we talked about and we really focused on how the electronegativity of the oxygen atom in a carbonyl pulls electrons away. All right, pulls electrons away from that carbonyl carbon, making it partially positive. Now in this chapter we're also going to take we're going to take the electron withdrawing characteristics of oxygen one bond further. And we're going to start focusing on these alpha carbons in an aldehyde or ketone. And of course, saying that the first thing we should do is properly define what an alpha carbon is. An alpha carbon is adjacent to the carbonyl carbon and the hydrogens connected to that alpha carbon are going to be termed alpha hydrogens. You see that right here. So this is an alpha carbon right here and the hydrogens that are attached to that alpha carbon are called alpha hydrogens. Now through induction, oxygen pulls some of the electron density out of these carbon hydrogen bonds, weakening, weakening them. And this makes it relatively easy to deprotonate the alpha carbons of an aldehyde or ketone. Now, the acidity of alpha hydrogens is, is augmented by resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. So specifically, when the alpha hydrogen is removed, an extra electron, the extra electrons that, that remain can resonate between the alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and the carbonyl oxygen. All right, so we can see that we can see that if we draw if we draw this out. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. If we have, for example, this right here, this al uh, this ketone. All right, 
Here is our carbonyl carbon. Here's our carbonyl oxygen. This carbon right here would be an alpha carbon. All right, if we had, say, a hydroxide ion that comes in, swoops, and takes that hydrogen, right, the hydrogen would dump its electrons here, all right, you would have electrons right there. So you can think of it as a negative charge. You have these two electrons right here. And what you can have is some resonance that happens, again, between the alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and the carbonyl oxygen. Now, what does this do? This increases the stability of the enolate intermediate. All right, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second as well. But through this resonance, the negative charge, what you notice is it can be distributed to the more electronegative oxygen atom. And the electron withdrawing oxygen atom thereby helps stabilize the carboanion. All right, carboanion is just a molecule with a negatively charged carbon atom, which is what we see here in what we drew. Now, when in basic solutions, alpha hydrogens will easily deprotonate, all right? And that's what we saw when we drew this, this scheme right here. Deprotonation of an alpha carbon forming a carboanion, all right? Our hydroxide's a base here, and you see that it deprotonated, all right? It, that alpha hydrogen was easily deprotonated. Now, the alpha hydrogens of ketones, they tend to be... They tend to be slightly less acidic than those of aldehydes if we were to compare. And that's due to the electron donating properties of the additional alkyl groups in a ketone. So this was a ketone. All right. It has these it has two R groups, two variable groups, whereas in an aldehyde, you'd have one R group and you would you know, this is one R group. This is a second for a ketone in an aldehyde. You'd have one R group, one variable group and then a hydrogen. All right, so it makes sense that the alpha hydrogens of ketones, they tend to be slightly less acidic than those of aldehydes because of the electron donating properties of having additional alkyl groups, R groups, in a ketone. And this property is the same reason that alkyl groups help to stabilize carbocations. All right, in this case, though, they destabilize the carboanion. Now, something else that you should ponder is steric hindrance in this regard. So in reactions, aldehydes are slightly more reactive to nucleophiles than ketones. All right. Aldehydes are slightly more reactive than ketones to nucleophiles. All right. This is this is due in part to steric hindrance in the ketone, which arises from, again, the additional alkyl groups that ketones contain. All right, so when the nucleophile approaches the ketone or aldehyde in order to react, the additional alkyl groups on the ketone are kind of in the way, all right? More so than just the single hydrogen of the aldehyde. And so this makes for a higher energy, more crowded intermediate step. And remember, higher energy intermediates mean that the reaction is gonna be less likely to proceed. All right, so a couple of things to note here. All right, ketones tend to be slightly less acidic than aldehydes. All right, and then because of steric hindrance, aldehydes are slightly more reactive to nucleophiles than ketones. All right, that is our first objective, talking about the general principles. Now we want to talk about enolate chemistry. So Due to the acidity of the alpha hydrogen, aldehydes and ketones exist in solution as a mixture of two isomers, all right? The familiar keto form, all right, and the enol form. So the enol form, it gets its name from the presence of a carbon-carbon double bond and an alcohol, all right? So the carbon-carbon double bond, the n Comp that's the N component, EN component, and an alcohol, that's the OL component of the name. Now, the two isomers, which if you look at them, right, they differ in the placement of a proton and the double bond. All right, notice. All right, these are called tautomers. The equilibrium between the tautomers, it lies 
far to the keto side. So there will be many more keto isomers in solution. The process of interconverting from the keto to the enol tautomer is called enolization or more generally ta tautomerization. So by extension, any aldehyde or ketone with a chiral alpha carbon will rapidly then become a racemic mixture as the keto and the enol forms interconvert. All right, this is a phenomena known as alpha uh, racemization. All right, so uh, you have now a racemic mixture. You have a racemic mixture of uh, uh, of the keto and the enol forms, the keto and the enol forms, and they interconvert. All right, now. Enols are really important intermediates in many reactions of aldehydes and ketones. The enolate carboanion results from the deprotonation of the alpha carbon by a strong base, right? We described that earlier. And some common strong bases include like the hydroxide ion, which is what we use to, to show how um, a hydrogen can be uh, deprotonated. The alpha hydrogen can be easily deprotonated. Now you have this pair of electrons and you can have resonance that happens between alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and the carbonyl oxygen. All right, so hydroxide ion is a, is a common strong base. You also have um, lithium diisopropyl amide, commonly known as LDA. You also have potassium hydride, KH. All right, um, a 1,3-dicarbonyl, for example, um, this is a particularly uh, acidic compound because there are two carbonyls to delocalize negative charge. And for this reason, it's often used to form enolate carboions. And once it's formed, the nucleophilic carboanions react readily with electrophiles. We're actually going to see one example of this shortly when we talk about aldol condensation. But another example of this type of reaction, we're going to scroll down here, all right, is Michael addition. That's shown right here in parts A and B, all right? It's, this is Michael addition in which the carboanion attacks an alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyl compound, all right? And this is a molecule with multiple bonds between the alpha and beta carbonyls that are next to uh alpha and beta carbons next to a carbonyl, all right? So the, this reaction, it proceeds as shown, all right, due to the resonance stabilization of the intermediates, all right? And the better you understand the resonance forms of molecules, the more you'll be able to predict the specific locations on a molecule where a reaction will occur. So if we look here, this, th these are examples of Michael addition here. If we look at part A, what you notice is that the base deprotonates the alpha carbon. All right, this alpha hydrogen gets swept up by the base. That hydrogen dumps its electrons there. All right, dumps its electrons between here. All right, to form a double bond. And you break that double bond in the carbonyl. So those that those electrons go to the oxygen. You form this first intermediate right here, right? You have a double bond right here. All right, now oxygen has an extra lone pair, hence it has a negative charge. But this can also interconvert because look at this. This is a, this is that example of a 1,3-dicarbonyl here, right? It has the ability to delocalize negative charge, all right, because there's two carbonyls. All right, and so it is often used to form enolate carboanions. So if we look at this intermediate we we formed right here, all right, what you what you notice is you can reform this double bond, all right, you can reform this double bond, um, this double bond can move over here, and then you can break this double bond as well, all right, and so you get this form. In addition, all right, so this base. That's that that deprotonates the alpha hydrogen, all right. That's that that is located at the alpha carbon. You can form these two. You can form this intermediate that has two resonance stabilized forms. All right. So the base deprotonates the alpha carbon, making it a good nucleophile. 
um, and you see the intermediate that's formed. Now, part B here, um, the carboanion attacks the double bond, okay, and this results in a Michael addition. So, we have this molecule right here, all right, and here is our intermediate, okay, because we have these two resonance forms, what this really looks like is that there is partial double bond character around this region, Okay, you can depict it as so because we have these two resonance structures. What happens here is that this can attack, all right, the double bond in this molecule, for example, and that is going to result in a Michael addition. So it attacks right here. We break this double bond and we, we, we move this double bond to this location, which breaks the double bond of our carbonyl, dumping the electrons on the oxygen. All right, and that way we have a Michael addition. All right, what you notice is that these two molecules have been added together to form one larger molecule. All right, so this is an example of a Michael addition. Now, another important thing that we, we want to talk about, all right, so this is two parts to the Michael addition. We saw how we can have a base that deprotonates the alpha carbon for this molecule, all right? It's making it a good nucleophile. We saw the intermediate that formed, it's resonance stabilized. That resonance stabilized intermediate can then attack, all right, the double bond of another molecule that you have in the mix, okay? And now you get a Michael addition. Something else that's important to talk about in this, in this section about enolate chemistry is kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. So given a ketone that has two different alkyl groups, for example, each of which may have alpha hydrogens, two forms of the enolate can form with the carbon-carbon double bond between the carbonyl carbon and either the more or less substituted carbon, All right? We kind of see this here, all right? What we have here, okay, uh, a, a ketone, all right? Now, the equilibrium between these forms, so from this um, this 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 molecule, you can have it form two different enolates. All right, you can have one where the double bond forms between what was the carbonyl and this methyl group right here, or the double bond can form on the other side of the carbonyl group, right? Because you have two different alpha uh, alpha carbons. So you have two different alpha hydrogens that can be deprotonated, hence you can form two different enolates, all right? And that's the example that we see with this molecule. So if we had a base, all right, the base can deprotonate the hydrogen at this location, we'll call it location one, or it can deprotonate the hydrogen in location two. Location one gives us this enolate, and location two gives us this enolate. And what you notice is that one is titled the thermodynamic enolate, and the other one is titled the kinetic enolate. So the equilibrium between these forms is really dictated, okay, by the kinetic and thermodynamic control of the reaction. The kinetically controlled product is formed more rapidly, but it is less stable, right? This form has the double bond to the less substituted alpha carbon, all right? This is the less substituted alpha carbon right here. That's why it's called, all right? And this is that kinetic enolate, all right? As expected, this product is formed by the removal of the alpha hydrogen from the less substituted alpha carbon, which is position two, because it offers less steric hindrance. There's not another, there's not a methyl group here in position two like there is in position one. Hence, it's less sterically hindered. And for that reason, it is the kinetic enolate forms more rapidly. But again, the, ca the caveat is that it's less stable because you form, all right, because you form the less substituted, you, you form the less substituted double bond, all right? This form has the double bond to the less substituted alpha carbon, I should say, all right? Now, the thermodynamically controlled product, it's formed more slowly, but it is more stable, all right? And it features the double bond being formed with the more substituted alpha carbon, which is position one, all right? 
So when the base deproteinates the alpha hydrogen in position one, we get the thermodynamic enolate, which is this right here. You notice it's formed at the more substituted alpha carbon position. It forms more slowly, but this is the more stable form. So in short, the kinetic enolate forms more quickly because of less steric hindrance, but it's less stable than the thermodynamic enolate. All right. So each of these two products, as you notice, is going to be it's going to be favored by different conditions. The kinetic product is favored in reactions that are rapid, irreversible at low temperatures and with strong sterically hindered base. All right. But if the reaction if the reaction is re reversible, all right, if the reaction is reversible, the kinetic product can actually revert to the original reactant and react again to form the thermodynamic product. The thermodynamic product is favored with higher temperatures, slow reversible reactions, and weaker, smaller bases. All right, so we can, we can take a look at this and we can make a list of when each of these enolates will be the more favored, all right, product, all right, because each of these two products is favored under different conditions. The kinetic enolate, all right, we said is favored in reactions that are rapid, irreversible, low temperature, all right, and with strong, sterically hindered bases. The thermodynamic enolate, though, it's formed and it's favored at high temperatures, all right, slow reversible reactions, and with weaker and smaller bases. All right. So that is how you want to think about kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. Now, just as enols are tautomers of carbonyls, enamines are tautomers of amines. All right. And amine is a compound that contains a carbon to nitrogen double bond. All right, the nitrogen in the amine that right you see right here, all right, may or may not be bonded to an alkyl group or other substituent. And through tautomerization, right, so the movement of a hydrogen and a double bond, amines can be converted into enamines. All right, kind of like what you see here. So on the right is the amine form, which is thermodynamically favored over the enamine form, which is on the left right here. So again, Tautomerization can happen also with nitrogen-containing compounds, these enamines and amines. Fantastic. With that being said, all right, those are all the main parts of objective two. All right, now what we can do is move into objective three, our final objective, and talk about aldol condensation. So this is another really important reaction you should know for the MCAT. This reaction follows the same general mechanism of nucleophilic addition to a carbonyl that we've seen in previous chapters. So in this case, however, an aldehyde or a ketone acts both as an electrophile in its keto form and a nucleophile in its enolate form. And the end result is the formation of a carbon-carbon bond. Now, what you see here, all right, what you see here um, is the aldol condensation reaction. We're going to take it step by step. So when an acetyl aldehyde, also known as ethanol, is treated with a catalytic amount of base, an enolate is produced. Now, the enolate is more nucleophilic than the enol because it is negatively charged. This nucleophilic enolate ion can react then with the electrophilic carbonyl group of another acetaldehyde molecule. All right, and the key to this reaction is that both species are in the same flask. So the product is 3-hydroxybutanol, which is an example of an aldol. An aldol is a molecule that contains both aldehyde and alcohol functional groups. All right, and note that this mechanism, it's still called an aldol reaction, even when the reactants are ketones. 
So here what we see is the aldol condensation, the first step, which is forming the aldol. All right. And just like we worked through this, right, we have an acetyl aldehyde. It's treated with a catalytic amount of base. And we have an enolate that is produced. All right. And then the enolate is more nucleophilic than the enol because it's negatively charged. All right. And then this nucleophilic enolate ion can react with the electrophilic carbonyl group of another acetyl aldehyde molecule, okay? And what we get when that happens is a final product, all right? This final product is 3-hydroxybutanol, which is an aldol. Now, with a strong base and high temperatures, all right, Dehydration occurs by an E1 or E2 mechanism. So we kick off a water molecule and then form a double bond, which produces an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl, which we see right here. So this next step is dehydration of the aldol. So the OH group all right, is removed as water, hence the dehydration. And instead, there is a double bond that forms between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. Now, aldol condensations are most useful if we only use one type of aldehyde or ketone. Because if there are multiple aldehydes or ketones, we actually we, we can't easily control which will act as the nucleophile and which will act as an electrophile. And the consequence of that is a mixture of products. All right, we're going to get a mixture of products as the end result. Now, this could be prevented if one of the molecules has no alpha hydrogens because the alpha carbons are quaternary. All right, like benzaldehyde. Now, this reaction is referred to as a condensation reaction because two molecules are joined with the loss of a small molecule. So this type of reaction is also a dehydration reaction because the small molecule that's lost is, you guessed it, water. Now, to that note of, 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 aldol, of, a, of an aldol condensation reaction, we can also talk about a retroaldol reaction. The reverse of this reaction you guessed it, it's called a retroaldol reaction. To, to push um, the reaction in the retroaldol re direction, aqueous base is added and also heat is applied. And the retroaldol reaction is useful for breaking bonds between the alpha and beta carbons of a carbonyl. Um, and this reaction is facilitated if the intermediate can be stabilized in the enolate form, just as in the forward reaction. So we can see that right here, the bond between the alpha and beta carbons of a carbonyl is broken. All right, so we have covered a lot of very, very important information. Let's quickly review before we end this video and move on to the problem set. All right, so speed round of everything we covered. We said that the carbon adjacent to the carbonyl carbon is termed an alpha carbon. And so then the hydrogens that are attached to an alpha carbon are called alpha hydrogens. Alpha hydrogens are relatively acidic and can be removed by a strong base. The electric the electron withdrawing oxygen of the carbonyl weakens the carbon-hydrogen bonds on an alpha carbon. The enolate that's resu that results from deprotonation can then be stabilized by resonance with the carbonyl. We also said that ketones are less reactive towards nucleophiles because of steric hindrance and alpha carboanion destabilization. Then we moved into objective uh, two, which is all about enolate chemistry. We said aldehydes and ketones exist in the traditional keto form, where there's a double bond between the carbon and oxygen, so there's a carbonyl group. And then they also exist in the less common form, which is the enol form. There's a double bond and a hydroxyl group. Tautomers are just isomers that can be interconverted by moving a hydrogen and a double bond. So what we can say is that the keto and enol forms are tautomers of each other. The enol form can be deprotonated in addition to form an enolate, and enolates are good nucleophiles. 
We saw an example of this in the Michael addition and enolate attacks an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, creating a bond. All right. Something else that we made mention of is the the difference and and the comparison between kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. Kinetic enolate is formed by fast, irreversible reactions at low temperatures with strong sterically hindered bases and thermodynamic enolates are favored by slower reversible reactions at higher temperatures with weaker smaller bases we also said like hey by the way it's not just aldehydes and and ketones that have the tautomer forms enamines are tautomers of imines and like enols enamines are the less common tautomer Last but not least, we covered aldol condensation. In the aldol condensation, the aldehyde or ketone act as both nucleophile and electrophile, resulting in the formation of a carbon-carbon bond in a new molecule that's called an aldol. An aldol contains both aldehyde and alcohol functional groups, and the nucleophile is the enolate formed from the deprotonation of the alpha carbon. The electrophile is going to be the aldehyde or ketone in the form of the keto tautomer. And then first, you're going to have a condensation reaction that occurs in which the two molecules come to together. And then after the aldol is formed, a dehydration reaction occurs. You have a loss of a water molecule. This results in an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl. You can also have the opposite reaction happen. This is called a retroaldol reaction, just the reverse of an aldol condensation reaction. And it's catalyzed by heat and a base. And in these reactions, the bond between the alpha and beta carbon is cleaved. All right, with that, we have covered chapter seven, aldehydes and ketones part two. In the next video, we're going to tackle a problem set together. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.